Now, there's just something about the 80s, right? I mean, there's, there's something about it. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's uh, the hair, the clothes. It was all so terrible, it was actually cool. Uh, and, and so now, because of the uniqueness of the 80s, we, we use it as like theme days for camp. We have like 80s day at camp and stuff like that. And meanwhile, we have other people who are still stuck in the 80s, right? It's just all 80s all the time for them. I think as a church, we need to have an 80s photo competition sometime. I mean, how cool would that be if we all found our best 80s photo, we submitted it, and we voted on who was the most 80s out of all of us. Uh, could someone put that together and organize it for us? But the other recognizable thing about the 80s was the music. 80s music has its own kind of sound, its own feel to it uh, that we listen to and we appreciate today. Now, in fact, I don't mean to offend anyone, but 80s music is now considered classic rock. <laughs> but one of the 80s songs and the 80s band that really made a hit was the 80s group called Rock Set. They came from Sweden in 1989, and they became famous for the song, Listen to Our, Your Heart. The catchy lyrics in the chorus said, listen to your heart, he's calling for you, listen to your heart, there's nothing else you can do. And it seems so cliche to us, but something deep inside of us loves this kind of thinking. Many songs, not just this one, follow this theme. Listening to our heart is often advice we give each other, or sometimes it's a worldview in which we live. However, listening to your heart can get you in a lot of trouble. It can lead to impulsive thinking, and the end results can lead to major regrets. We probably can all tell stories where we listen to our heart and share how it didn't work out so well for us. And it's for this very reason, listening to our hearts, that we turn to the book of Hebrews today. See, we are trying to live with endurance. But when facing endurance, our heart often tells us, oh, stop, you're hurting. It's okay. Quit going. Go back. Just listen to me. Do anything but endure. And yet our heart can do something even greater, more powerful. So how do we really listen to our hearts? How do we continue on? What is a better way to interpret this idea of listening to our hearts? All this we find in Hebrews chapter 3, but let's pray before we go on. God, we all feel so much inside of us, something that points to deeper things. And yet we all know and feel what it's like for our own hearts to deceive us or even betray us. So please allow your spirit today to steer our hearts towards something better. Pour through me the gift of preaching that the endurance of Christ may grow in our hearts. It's in your name that I pray. Amen. Amen. Hebrews chapter 3 Verse 1, therefore, holy brothers and sisters who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, whom we acknowledge as our apostle and high priest. He was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses was faithful in all God's house. Jesus has been found worthy of greater honor than Moses, just as the builder of a house has a greater honor than the house itself. For every house builder is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's house, bearing witness to what would be spoken by God in the future. But Christ is faithful as the son over, the son over God's house, and we are his house, if indeed we hold firmly to our confidence and the hope in which we glory. So from the start of this chapter, a significant statement is made that we can almost miss. It is said we share in this heavenly calling. Now, one of the greatest temptations of the Bible 
is to just make it into theological exercise, an intellectual exercise that has nothing to do with today. But the start of Hebrews chapter 3, the preacher of Hebrews wants us to know that theology, especially theology about Jesus, has profound implications for us, for you and I in our everyday life. The start of the chapter is calling us to pay attention to Jesus because this word that we read today is for us. And yet almost immediately after saying that, the sermon plunges into this weird debate about Moses and Jesus. And on the surface level, it seems kind of petty. It reminds me of uh, sports talk this time of year. Here in Colorado, we don't have much sports talk to talk about unless you want to talk about the Rockies, and that's a pretty painful proposition. So one of the real topics I came across this week online in our Colorado sports talk is which quarterback would you rather have, John Elway or Peyton Manning? Now, this is an impossible, hypothetical question. You can't answer it. They're both good in their own time, right? But it's built for sports talk, just a way to kill some time. And the conversation between Moses and Jesus seems to be pretty similar to this. Like, they're both pretty significant people in the story of the Bible. Well, what do you mean, Rankum? What are we to do here? And so, in order to explain what the preacher is trying to say here, I need to do this by explaining my favorite video, video game of all time. It's called Madden, okay? Now, I haven't played this video game for eight years because, well, Silas is eight years old, so you can do the math. <laughs> but I used to love to play this video game, okay? And here's the deal. The video game is the same every single year. But you know what? Every year, you buy the video game. You, you spend the 50, 60 bucks to buy the video game because the player rankings change. Okay, it is a big deal in the Madden culture that I'm uh, glad to fill you all in on. <laughs> in what the player rankings are, they are on a scale from one to 99. One is the worst, 99 is the best. I had a friend in college who literally made himself in Madden, and I think he was a 13. Right? He was terrible. We lost every game that he was playing in the video game, but it was a creative idea. So the best players are 99. And there's this thing called the 99 Club, okay? So every year, the 99 the Club is celebrated. They get awards. They get plaques. Vaughn Miller, uh, our star, was 99 for several years, and we got to celebrate that fact. And so what the Hebrew preacher is trying to tell us is... Abraham, Moses, David, they're all in the 99 club, okay? They played a pretty significant role in the Bible. But there's only one 100. The only 100 is Jesus. Perfect in every way, but without sin. Jesus is above it all. And that's why it immediately after this plunges into a metaphor about home builders, okay? Now, uh, th this is an interesting metaphor, and if you've ever known a home builder, they're pretty prideful about the houses they built. They'll take you around town and they'll say, oh, I built that house, I built this house, and they should be. It's a huge accomplishment to be able to do those things. And so it's like Abraham, Moses, and David. Those guys were the subcontractors. Abraham helped lay the foundation, Moses framed the house, and David put the roof on. But ultimately... It was God managing it all. It was Jesus above all things. The house belongs to God. And this is where the first hearers would have struggled in the book of Hebrews. Because they'd be tempted to think of the, the house of God as the temple, as a building. And we can get so attached to buildings, physical buildings. And Hebrews is trying to remind us, no, 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 the church is not a building. We're the church. We are the church. We are God's handiwork. In other words, we have a home. We have a family. We have a place to belong. And this is important to remember as we watch carefully as how, as the Hebrew writer starts to build on this Moses thing. So as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during your time of testing in the wilderness. When your ancestors tested and tried me, though for 40 years they saw what I did. 
That is why I was angry with that generation. I said, their hearts are always going astray, and they, they have not known my ways. So I declared on an oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. See to it, my brothers and sisters, that none of you have a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. So this is a quote from Psalms 95. It's a sad song where Israel remembers the failures of their past. God has miraculously saved them from Pharaoh's uh, oh, oh, from Pharaoh lording over them from slavery. God lead them, led them into the promised land. He parted the seas for them. He guided them with a burning cloud at night and a cloud during the day. In the desert, God gave them manna to eat and dew to drink. And he gave them rules to follow at Mount Sinai. And they show up to the promised land after God has done all these things. And they see the people and they're like, Nope, God can't do it. Let's pack up and go home to Egypt. It's like, what? You really think those people are too numerous, too big, too scary after everything that has happened in the past? And the question that jumps off the page in the books of Hebrew, in the book of Hebrews is, are we any better? I mean, if we really sat down, if I really sat down with each one of you, I bet you we could talk about stories where God has provided for you and your family and has been faithful to you. And the question is, why do we not trust God with the next challenge? Has God not proven faithful? Why do we question God in the future when we see what God has done in the past? And so it is for this reason that the Hebrew preacher has to give one more comparison to Moses. We have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end. As it has been said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt? And with whom was, angry, was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies perished in the wilderness? And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest, if not to those who disobeyed? So we see that they were, un, were not able to enter because of their unbelief. You know, walking around town, it's pretty interesting to see who recognizes me and who doesn't. I'm sitting at the hooligan race this year, and you know, you're just waiting and waiting for the hooligan race to start, and it's, a, it's like waiting on the Lord to arrive sometimes, you know, <laughs> you've been to it. And this lady behind me goes, well, how are things at Poncha Springs Church of Christ? I go, what? I had never met this lady before, I've never been introduced before, but somehow she knows who I am. So we had a great conversation. However, this week I was getting my monthly allergy shot at the hospital and there were two ladies sitting next to me while I waited who were clearly Christians and thankfully, for the reasons that I'm about to explain, they did not recognize me. And they're talking about their churches. One goes to a small church in town that's probably going to die this year. It's probably going to shut its doors. The, the numbers have dwindled too small. They can no longer sustain it. And the other lady who attended another church in town asked her, well, why is your church dying? And I'll quote what this lady said. Well, the pastor is no good. And when the pastor is no good, the church dies. Whew, adding some pressure to me. <laughs> the other lady chimes in. And she goes to one of the biggest churches in town and she starts listing all the weaknesses of her preacher and all the things she doesn't like about him. And I'm sitting here listening to this brutal conversation working on this sermon. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, is this biblical? <laughs> or is what they're saying is because we know the church talk well you know well if the minister would just really then we would just be okay hmm is this biblical 
Because the point the Hebrew preacher is trying to make is it's not me. It's you. It's you. If you really want to hear the truth, the truth today, your faith is no one else's besides yourself. You are, are responsible for your own faith, for your own actions. And judging by these two ladies' standards, Moses wouldn't be qualified to work at their churches. <laughs> because that is what the preacher of Hebrews is saying right now. I'm dead serious. They have the best leader of all time. Hey, you got Moses. How many churches would love to have Moses? And the people are terrible. <laughs> I mean, you know it's really bad when you have to crush up the Ten Commandments and make the people drink it. That's a lesson, right? Uh, we better not do that at the potluck sometime or anything like that. It wasn't going well. Because even these people, with Moses leading them, their hearts were turned against God. They continued to sin against God. Which means we all have to take responsibility and accountability for ourselves, for how we're living out this faith, how we're living out this calling in our life, how we're being the best followers of Jesus we can be, no matter how good or bad our perceived leaders might be. So allow me to let you in on a little well-known preaching secret. Preachers who judge a sermon by how everyone responds, they often don't preach very long because the metric leads to a lot of disappointment. Let's be honest. But if the metric's being faithful to the scriptures given that week and being faithful to God, that is something worth preaching about. So the question the Hebrew preacher is asking is not how you will respond to me in this sermon or to Moses or to the preacher of Hebrews. The Hebrew preacher is asking, how will you faithfully respond to God? And so in order to have this kind of faithfulness, chapter 3 keeps circling around this one issue. The issue of the condition of our heart. Where's your heart at? I mean, think about that today. Where's your heart at? Is it angry? Is your heart against God? Is your heart fearful? Is your heart worried? Is your heart anxious? Is your heart stressed? The way we would explain this in the words of Hebrews is having a hard heart. And a hard heart can stop loving back. It can stop trusting. It can turn to all other forms of security. The definition of a hard heart is what listening to your heart sounds like with the rock set lyrics in that 80s song. An unchecked heart is prone to wander, just like we sung about. Our hearts can find all kinds of loves, not just adultery, but the love of stuff, of things, of status symbols, the love of power, and so many other things. Robert Roberts, who wrote the song we sang before this, wrote these lyrics. He came to faith as a young man in a gang in England. Wrote this beautiful song and there's this lady singing the song in the carriage, and he's riding next to her. She goes, what a wonderful, beautiful song. He said, I am the poor, wretched man who wrote that song, and I would give a thousand worlds just to feel that way again. Again. Because his heart had wandered. He had lost his love. And so the big question Hebrews 3 hits us with is do we want to go to the promised land? Man, the promised land sounds good. The land flowing with milk and honey. Do we want to get, go there? Because the promised land on the surface seems great. The, way, the ways where God provides for us, sustains us, and allows us to flourish in life, that seems so amazing. But going over the mountain passes to get there, that's rough. That requires trust. Trust that God will provide for us. Part of love is trusting. Trusting that God loves us too. So in order to not be like the Israelites forever wandering in the wilderness, there were little glimmers of advice in Hebrews chapter 3. Maybe you picked out some of them. One of my favorites is, did you catch that word about as long as it's today? As long as it's today. It is said we, are, we have to encourage one another as long as it's today. One of the things and the reasons why we show up to church every week is not just to sing, to take communion, to study the text, but to encourage each other. 
when we're around each other, as long as it's today, we have to be encouraging each other because it's really, really hard to walk this road, to trust God. And so part of the gift God gives us is each other, to encourage each other. But more than importantly, it's an invitation to live into the present. Following Jesus isn't just plotting a course on a map, using your GPS and saying, oh, this is what it's going to be like to follow Jesus. No, those plans don't work out very well. <laughs> following Jesus to the best of your ability means following Jesus today. In this eternal present that God has gifted us with, to do our best to be faithful and to trust God today. And you know what's crazy? If you start doing that, just trying to live in today, how can I be faithful today? <clears throat> then you do that day. And then you do it the next day. And the next day, and before you know it, you're in this habit and you've stacked up a whole bunch of todays. And I believe that's what a faithfulness in following God looks like, is st stacking up a whole bunch of todays. It's almost like Jesus said, do not worry about tomorrow, about what you will eat and drink or what you will wear. Those problems have enough worries of their own. Worry about today. We are praying for today, for our daily bread today. That's what we pray for. And there's another tip. In verse 6, there's this line about holding firmly to our hope and our confidence. One of our greatest anxieties in life can come from when we have no foundation. Nothing to hold us secure. And life is full of doubt and questions and deconstruction and reconstruction. And those are important processes to go through. But if you aren't careful, those things can chew you up and spit you out. See, one can easily convince themselves that the monsters in their closet are bigger than the God who so deeply loves them. But you know what cures that fear? Confidence. If Christ is your firm foundation, then when the storms of life come, you aren't stirred around too much. If God is your rock, then the mountains don't seem so big and scary. And at risk of being too abstract, let me be a little bit more practical for a second. If God is your confidence and your hope, then when the diagnosis comes in, it hits differently. When the tragedy happens, you grieve differently. The job loss isn't as scary. When we walk into those baptismal waters, we declare we are under a different set of rules. We are now living under the kingdom of God. We are living in the heavenly realm, and while this life provides many incredible, difficult challenges, we hold firmly because we have confidence. So let me remind us all, as followers of Jesus, we are called to love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And hopefully Hebrews chapter 3 helps us unpack what loving God with all of our heart looks like. We find out this week, in our third week in this path in endurance, that having a heart set on God is one of the ways we live with endurance. So we must be constantly looking into our hearts. The temple of the living God, God's house, us, God's house, where we might need repairs, where we might need uh, uh, restoration, and it's not just on us. The Holy Spirit joins us in this. The Holy Spirit comes in and does a home inspection of sorts. And home inspections are scary, right? You never know what's going to pop up when you have a home inspection when you're getting ready to buy a place. But you know what's scarier? Not doing a home inspection, okay? Because if you find some issues out in the home inspection... You can repair it. You can work on it before the building's condemned, before the whole thing collapses. You can take care of the issues. But if you don't do a home inspection, you never know. And so what I want to lead us into here in a second is a time of meditation and prayer for us. A time of a home inspection of sorts between you and God to have this time of introspection, a chance to listen to your heart. So the world might tell us to listen to our heart one way, but let me offer to you another way to listen to your heart. 
All the love songs the world can offer don't add up or compare to the love God is sending over us. So I'm going to play in a second, or Steve is for us, uh, a new song. Back it up, or yeah, it's going to start. Um, and for some of us that have been at Poncha Springs for a while, you may not know this song. Those of you visiting, I think you're going to know this song. Okay, Sing Out, if you know this song. Now, this song just missed the 80s by two years. But I think it gives us a different perspective of what it means to listen to our hearts. So I hope you feel free to sing along or pray or meditate. But mostly, I hope you can reflect with the Holy Spirit on the inside of what it looks like to have a heart focused on God. So with that being said, let's enter this time together. How do you explain? To tell you of our love, so listen to our heart. 